I have no idea how old I was. Probably about ten. I found myself in my neighbor's basement, observing for the first time a virtual world displayed in 8-bit glory. And it wasn't just the music of Konji Kondo that got my attention. It wasn't even the surprisingly advanced behavior of the autonomous agents that inhabited that virtual world, all the while clearly responding to the environmental stimuli using a deterministic pattern. Now for me what was interesting was the limitless number of possibilities that this game could seemingly go. Now I know that's laughable compared to today's notions of open world gaming, but go with me. The game cartridge did not come with any source code, nor did it come with pseudocode for the algorithm that decided how these game foes would behave. But of course an astute player with an intuitive sense of the scientific method could easily reverse engineer the model pretty quickly. And if artificial intelligence had called it a day at Koopa Troopers, Hammer Brothers, and Goombas, we would not be talking about explainable AI today. Consider what does it mean to enumerate the space of all functions. Realize it's possible to write down every possible function. Most of them are a waste of time, don't worry about it. We can enumerate them, should we want to or need to. There's lots of possible functions out there, lots of possible computer programs. That's basically our important axiom. All right, now a function is just a fancy way of saying mapping. I give you x, you return y. Sometimes y is three times x. In other functions, it's the square root of x. That function could be something more interesting. And with only the smallest leap of faith for those not willing to brave the literature, all of this scales up. Given a photo, which is just a really big number, get back a caption, also a really big number. Now, obviously, that function existed. The image net question was always about how and when, not if. So does a function exist which can inspect data from prison inmates and make estimates of the likelihood they can re-enter society and achieve self-sufficiency without resorting to future crime? Yes. Without a doubt, this function exists. In fact, there's probably a whole class of such functions depending on how we decide to pick the best one. Yeah, I didn't say it had to be a good one. I just said it existed. Oh, well, we want the best one, right? How are we going to define what's best? Well, of course, it should be not biased. Great idea. How are we going to do that? How do we measure bias and in turn instruct our learning algorithms to use techniques like regularization in order to eliminate that bias? Well, actually, we need to be careful of how we phrase that question to the machine. We probably can't or don't want to actually mathematically eliminate the bias. We want to minimize it. Maybe even minimize it under some extreme penalty and not allow but the tiniest fraction. Be careful what you ask for. It wasn't until my adulthood that I returned to that Super Mario Brothers game and noticed to my surprise, it has a score. And no, I don't mean the coins. Obviously, I know about the coins. I want to get to 100 coins to get a free life. You get points for things like stomping on an enemy. And in fact, if you want to add up your points pretty quickly, you get increasingly high points, almost exponentially, by doing this sort of chain of stompings, killing a line of foes all in one go. But what are these points even for? I mean, so what if you plugged in Alpha Zero to Super Mario Brothers, and instead of asking it to save the princess, you asked it to maximize its points? I really think we would be delighted to see some of the insane and wacky behavior that Alpha Zero would come up with as it tries to optimize for this, quite frankly, kludgy and unnecessary number that is just sort of off in the corner in Super Mario Brothers. Machine learning is specifically useful in those cases where it's not trivial to look at a noisy and complex data set and perform an inference. Any machine learning model worth having outside of a classroom is going to be sufficiently complex. The only way to be truly satisfied that a model is fully interpretable is to go get an advanced degree in machine learning, after which you can apply all of your wisdom to do a forensic precision level deconstruction and simulation of that model until you are fully satisfied that you personally understand it in and out and every little nook and cranny of the manifold it describes. And I'm not being crass when I say that. Perhaps this is the level of scrutiny that needs to be done for models of extreme consequence. 
You know, don't they send three sacrificial mathematicians every generation to go double-check David Hilbert's work or something like that? Models are not our enemies, they're our tools. And like any tool, they can be used for good or for ill. And an open-source, fully transparent, inspectable model solves a lot of problems. But for the 99% of the rest of the time, when that level of precision inspection is just not an option for whatever reason, machine learning models are here, and they're here to stay. There's no room for Luddites or reactionaries, but there is a lot of room for inspection, transparency, tooling, and, of course, skepticism. Welcome to Data Skeptic Interpretability, a podcast about black box algorithms, white box algorithms, transparency, obscurity, machine learning, and consequences. This week on the show, we've got an interview with... My name is Christoph, currently a PhD. My topic is interpretable machine learning. Christoph is the author of Interpretable Machine Learning, a guide for making black box models interpretable. I've got a physical copy right here in my hands. You can get a digital version as well, and we'll have some more details about that towards the end of the show. Christoph and I discuss a little bit about his book, Interpretability in General, and how you, yes you, can get started today. All that and more right after the break. Thanks to this week's sponsor, the 2020 Gartner Data and Analytics Summit in Grapevine, Texas, March 23rd through 26th. Now is the time to act. You can save $350 with my early bird code. Those of you traveling on the company dime, keep in mind that your boss may have a budget for events and travel and this sort of thing. And if he or she doesn't use that up, they might lose it. The agenda has gone up on the web. Two keynotes that caught my eye were Lee McMullen speaking on creating a culture that is ready for AI and Dr. Hannah Fry, who I love. She's on more or less all the time. I read one of her books. She's great. Professor, mathematician, author. That's just the tip of the iceberg across the eight tracks they're offering. Visit Gartner.com slash U.S. slash data. That's Gartner, G-A-R-T-N-E-R dot com slash U.S. slash data. There, enter the discount code, all caps, no spaces, data skeptic. My name is Christoph. I am doing a PhD at the Institute of Statistics at the LMU Munich. My topic is interpretable machine learning. So you're not only studying it, but you literally wrote the book on it. Can you tell me a little bit about that process? Yeah, funny enough, uh, the book came before studying. Uh, Well, I, I did have to study for the book, of course, but I started the book before I started the PhD. The book led me to do a PhD, yeah. I imagine most of my listeners will already be familiar with the notion of machine learning interpretability. But just in case, do you have a high-level definition of what it means to have interpretable machine learning? So most people would say, like, interpretability is the degree to which you can understand the decision-making or individual decisions of a machine learning model. I kind of use it as a catchphrase for, or like a keyword for any method that tries to make sense of how a machine learning model makes a decision. Who is it really for? Is this for a data scientist or machine learning engineer who's trying to get some insight? Or maybe someone with no ML and stats background who's wondering how the heck this uh, algorithm works? I had in mind uh, as an audience, uh, people who have some background in machine learning and in data science. So the ones who actually then use uh, those methods and and implement those. Also more maybe for debugging the models. So not actually showing these plots, uh, like partially pens, but uh, all the other chapters I have in the book, not showing those to to layman. So I think this needs some more effort. So with that in mind that these are really at this point, or at least the tools you cover are tools for engineers and developers. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the appropriate point at which someone should pick up your book in their journey to learn machine learning. Uh, Obviously, if you don't know what logistic regression is yet, probably go learn that first. But maybe don't wait till you're done with your PhD to start learning about interpretability. Where is your book a good match on that journey? So yeah, so I kind of require the people who read my book to know what machine learning is and to have some experience and understand what the goal of machine learning is and maybe know a few algorithms for machine learning. 
but then I would say you could start quite early with it. So, and also if you, let's say you are very, um, like just starting to learn about machine learning, I think very often you're actually at the point where you say, oh, I, I actually would like to understand now how machine learning models my data, As, especially if you apply machine learning for like not for learning machine learning itself, but you need maybe machine learning for something else. So maybe you're an ecologist and, and now work with machine learning and then it's a very, you will very, very soon have the question, uh, have questions about how the model makes decisions and so on. So um, I think it could be good to get started early also with interpretability. What is it about a machine learning algorithm that allows it to be uninterpretable? So even if you have a decision tree, which at least to many people would come natural to understand how the decision comes about. So if you just follow the path for the tree, then you get in the end, like uh, step by step, how the tree came to a decision. But if you make the tree really deep, then you have hundreds of steps, maybe, or at least dozens of steps. So then it's already hard to understand the model. So even if you have a like a simple model, it becomes very uninterpretable very soon. So with more depth or with more features. Yeah, the tree is an excellent example because uh, I think I've seen many presentations where uh, presenters have independently arrived at the same joke about, you know, here's a textbook example of like Titanic or something. And, oh, great, I can understand this tree. And then they show you a, a practical one that's actually probably used in production. And it's a hundred nodes and even visualizing, it's almost impossible. But I imagine that more complicated model if I were to zoom in at any point, let's say just look at maybe a subtree of five to six nodes, I could understand that very well. So how does my understanding break down when I can zoom in and understand pieces of it, but I don't understand the big picture? What you're talking about is kind of doing a simplification of the model. That's also what, what many methods do, that they try to explain the model behavior. I would say you always lose something. So you lose some of the details of the decision-making process or you simplify it so much that it's just an approximation of what the model does, but not exactly what the model does. Making a simpler model sort of implies it's going to be easier to understand. That's fairly intuitive to me. But you also seem to lose something, that trade-off you were describing. Do you think that that's sort of a, a no-free-lunch situation? Is there Does there have to be a trade-off? Or in time, will, I don't know, better methodologies and things like that close a gap of some kind? So my, my intuition or my thinking is that if you, were, you would have such a simple model, then we wouldn't need machine learning in the first place because then we could represent or, or, or solve our problem with simple rules or a very simple model. So the reason when we uh, use a machine learning model is that it gives us some extra performance, which you wouldn't get with a simpler model. So I think there's always this uh, trade-off. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if you're aware of any instances where people have had to debate that trade-off in practice. I could think of maybe a situation like, I don't know, a medical model where a doctor would prefer a simple model, even though it has less accuracy, because they can spend some time and interpret it versus a totally black box, more accurate model. Maybe there'd be a preference there. Are people at the level where they're making choices like that, to the best of your knowledge? One example is from one of the jobs I had before I started a PhD. So I worked in medical research and there, it wasn't even a question because it was very clear that we would use like classic statistical models where you get like a neat coefficient uh, in the end for, or like when you build a prediction model, you get the coefficient, which you can then interpret, uh, report the p-values for it and so on. So there, it was kind of out of the question for answering the research question to use a machine learning model. So it was clear that we, we would use an interpretive model, especially like a linear model where you can interpret the coefficients and the significance uh, level of those. So I think a very cynical person might say, uh, kind of to your point earlier, that if you can truly interpret, uh, deeply interpret a model, then that model must be simple to the point where one could question why you applied machine learning to begin with. Again, to be you know very cynical and pessimistic, it almost feels like model interpretability is necessarily a, a losing fight because the very fact that we're using machine learning implies the problem is not trivial. What are your thoughts to someone who's uh, at that level of cynicism? So I think it's not black and white. Yes, you cannot understand your model to all the details or everything about your model. 
but that doesn't ultimately mean that it's a pure black box and you don't understand anything at all. So like all the tools that you can use or that we have for interpretability give you at least some information about the model, even if it does, doesn't make it fully interpretable. So you gain some knowledge about how the model behaves, what the most important features were for the classification or for the prediction. And you can also analyze for individual predictions what the, the most important features were, for example. So you get a lot out of the model. So in the book, you cover three great instructional data sets, the bike rentals, YouTube spam comments, and the risk factors for cervical cancer. I was wondering if you could pick maybe one of those, uh, your favorite or perhaps the best example, and go into a little detail about what the data set contains, what types of models people generally train, and um, how they're good demonstrations of what uh, interpretability actually means in practice. So yeah, I kind of looked up the data sets that are freely available on the internet. So I guess if you're a machine learning, you see those often. <laughs> one data set I actually like is the bike data set. It's because I also bike myself and you see like interesting patterns as well when you do interpretation of the data set. It's about uh, bike sharing and how many bikes were rented over like a period of two years, given like the weather and calendar attributes. And you see really nice patterns there like um, that people, more people are, uh, rent bikes when uh, it's uh, like a warmer temperature, but it actually drops again a little if it's too hot and things like this. So it's a good, good data set uh, for, you can relate to it if you bike. <laughs> so your book covers a wide variety of the techniques that have emerged, everything from Lime to partial dependency plots and SHAP values and things like that. Some of those techniques are, from a methodology perspective, wildly different. In particular, I think of like Shapley values that have a little bit of game theory in them you don't see elsewhere, or maybe Lime, which was very familiar to me as a machine learning person. Why do you think we've seen such a variety of different techniques that are kind of not always methodologically similar under the hood? Yeah, I think they're just different approaches. So in, in some sense, they are quite similar. So all these model agnostic methods have this commonality that they all do some kind of sensitivity analysis. So they all rely on manipulating the, the features and then measuring again how the, the prediction changes. So in that sense, they are quite similar sometimes. Also, there's some connection between uh, Shapley values and Lime. So you can represent both as like a linear regression model. And so, so there are also some similarities. Are there models that you believe maybe are a little bit hopeless to try and pursue for interpretability? I'm thinking in particular of deep learning neural networks where you know, they have potentially millions of parameters. And yes, there are techniques, but maybe some super advanced uh, algorithm that makes very specific choices will just be beyond the reach of one single professional to fully appreciate. Am I being too pessimistic there? Or uh, maybe is nature not so cruel that it hands us problems that are that hard? I, I guess my overall question is, are there models that you think might be useful, but impossible to interpret? I would make more distinction between different types of data or prediction tasks than between different models. For example, because we have lots of model agnostic tools that just require manipulating the data to get some um, explanation of the model. So then the methods are very different. Um, if you have, for example, tabular data, where, where it's clear how you, for example, can manipulate the data, but it gets harder or more difficult to manipulate maybe text data and it gets even more difficult if your input space or your features uh, is not interpretable itself. So then you have a really, really hard time to make this interpretable. So if you don't even understand the input features, for example, if you have some sensor where it's difficult to interpret some sensor readings, or if your features are maybe some embeddings or some other latent uh, variables, maybe thousands of latent variables, I think that's that's the case where it gets really difficult to interpret the model then afterwards, no matter what the model is then that you use afterwards. Model interpretability feels like a very kind of contemporary and almost new topic to me. Um, obviously, it's getting a lot more publicity and a lot more interest in papers and things like that, which is great. But I'm reminded of things like the FICO score, which even though maybe it's not using machine learning, 
It's a secret algorithm as far as I know, but they tell you a lot about the FICO credit scoring system, you know, that it looks at these types of variables and it might consider these types of features. Do you consider that under the same umbrella as model interpretability? Um, so, yeah, the, the topic in itself is not new. I, I mean, also in statistics, interpretability was always or is always in, in the center of modeling data. I think it's just came up with, with kind of the machine learning community now um, that, that we have had first this heavy focus on, hey, we can do really good predictions, especially now with for images and text with neural networks, but also for other data with XGBoost, for example. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say it's new. And also, I think we can learn a lot from the old approaches. I'm not, not sure about the FICO score. Oh, um, simply that they, uh, I don't know too much about it, but I'm aware that like if you get a credit score here in the States, there'll be some indications like your score could be improved if you, I don't know, hadn't made three late payments or there's little kind of hints like that without apparently revealing the whole algorithm. Yeah, I, I think there's so many techniques, uh, not new really. I mean, this is what you just said is then kind of like a counterfactual explanation. So you have some score and they tell you what you would need to change to get a different score. So in this sense, I think, yeah, this is very similar. Gotcha. So I was thinking maybe it'd be useful to talk about what I took to be the simplest kind of option you share in the book, which is the rule fit interpretable model. Could you give listeners a high level of what rule fit is and why it's such a sort of nice example of interpretable machine learning? Rule fit combines decision rules and linear models. And also on some high level, it combines like classical stats models and also a more machine learning like approach. So the idea is that in the end, you have a linear model, a linear regression model or like a logistic regression model, but you don't only use the, the features that you have from your data, but you also generate new features. And this you do automatically uh, from your data and by building decision rules. So you take your data and try to build decision rules. So basically you build trees. This could be done, for example, for random forest or other uh, tree ensembles. And then you take the routes from the root node to, to each of the leaves. So that's always like a one decision rule. So you can pick the trees apart and make multiple features out of the sing out of single trees and then feed them also into your regression model. That's the basic idea of rule fit. Gotcha. So a relatively simple technique. Sounds like one that's even pretty easy to implement. Uh, why do we need other methods? Where does this one perhaps fall short? One thing which is more anecdotal, but examples I tried, it wasn't that performant. Surprisingly, so it was my intuition that it should work really well, but this is something you just have to find out if it works on your data or not. If you want to interpret your model, one thing to have is usually, or what is always good is sparsity. With rule that you're doing the opposite. And instead of making your model more sparse, you're actually, you're adding more features. There is some regularization so that some terms get a zero coefficient, but still you're generating lots and lots of new features and probably end up with more features than if you were to use only a decision tree or only a linear model. So there are many techniques that you cover in the book. Once you kind of get a mastery of them, maybe you can see some commonalities across them. But perhaps to uh, a young reader going through this for the first time, they would say, wow, there's a lot of things to learn here. Is there a most universal technique that you should pick up first, or maybe a quick flow chart for how you decide the ideal technique to study for your application? Uh, basically, where do people get started? Well, so or the biggest difference is between different types of data. So if you uh, if you have a certain application and you need interpretability and your input data is tabular data, then you there's a certain set of methods that you can use. And there's a different set of methods that you can use for, for example, image data. Then the next distinction is between model agnostic and model specific methods. So that I would decide what's important to you. For example, if it's important to you that you can exchange the underlying model, then you would start using model agnostic methods. Oh, could we break that down? I think I haven't asked you yet what that means. What's the difference between a model agnostic and a model specific method? What are these two distinctions? Model agnostic means that the methods work no matter what the underlying model is. And the only way that, that this can work is that the method itself sees the model as a black box and just manipulates the input features and observes the output. 
For example, uh, one method which is called permutation feature importance uh, works in this way. So it shuffles input features and then observes how much the predictive performance drops of the model. So it's not required then for this method to know whether the underlying model is a linear model or a neural network or a random forest. Model specific methods kind of require to look inside the model. So for example, if you have uh, saliency maps for neural networks, which require access to the gradient of the model, this is what I would call a model specific method because this wouldn't work for uh, random forests, for example. So with model interpretability being applied, you know, if, if let's say a company develops some new model of how they want to make a recommender system or what, you know, promotional marketing to send out, the tools might be useful internally, but I don't necessarily have any sympathy, you know, for the company. If, if they do a bad job figuring out how to apply machine learning and they send me the wrong promo, uh, I'm just not going to buy anything or maybe unsubscribe. So it's their loss. But when it comes to like, medical tools, or maybe uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about algorithms used in courtrooms for determining sentencing and things like this. Clearly, interpretability is playing a major role. Do you have any thoughts on the degree to which we have the right tools to make socially responsible decisions like that? So what, what I cover in my book are mostly, I would say, tools for developers. So kind of debugging tools and also to get some understanding of the model to so really like when you like use those tools in the field i think this requires a lot more work to to make it work people often say is that interpretability is also context dependent if you give some people like a decision tree they might immediately know how to interpret it and how to deal with it but uh, some different group of people might not be trained to use them uh, same goes for other types of models or other types of outputs. So this is heavily context dependent. Even the same person might uh, prefer different uh, explanations at different times. So it's a, it's a doctor and has to make a very, very quick decision in, in surgery, for example, then you, don't, you wouldn't want like a longish uh, explanation, but something very short maybe. Um, but in some other settings, they might prefer a longer explanation from a model. So I think this requires really deep research about the, like the application itself. Yeah, uh, my personal opinion has been that all these techniques you cover, they're, they're excellent techniques and I want to use them, but I'm going to use them sort of as guidance or heuristics more than I would like a formal proof of uh, convergence or something like that. In other words, I wouldn't necessarily argue one of these tools uh, for sure is the explanation and let's use that in a courtroom. They seem more like uh, guidance or, or heuristics or things like that. Um, so obviously I have sort of a, a value of the techniques, but not, a, not an extreme value in the sense that I would just blindly trust them. What's your perspective? How formal or, or rigorous should we think of the results we get from these methods? I think uh, you have a very healthy perspective on, on this. Um, so yeah, I would see it the same. These are kind of like heuristics or indicators that tell you it doesn't tell you exactly what the model does. It, it always gives you some kind of, or you can check that your model doesn't do something very stupid, um, but you don't have like a, it's, it's not a formal, like a formal proof that now the temperature is the, the most important. So, and, and you should always be aware of the limitations because and this is true for most methods that they kind of assume or, or, or that, the, that all of your features are independent and which is usually not the case because you always have some correlation or dependence within your data. So, and then you have to be careful afterwards for when you do the interpretation. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like see it as like a, like a f physical law afterwards, the, the explanation you get out of it, but more as a heuristic. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about specific your, specifically your PhD work. Uh, what are the precise contributions you're working on at the moment? So in the beginning, I worked mostly on, on the book and also on an R package, which implements some of the methods, such as partial dependence plot and permutation feature importance. Um, this year, I worked on a project where we uh, tried to, to measure some complexity of machine learning models also in a model agnostic way. Um, for example, uh, measure how much interaction effects a model covers. And currently I'm 
working on this topic, um, what do you do with when you have dependent features so that they are, for example, correlated, and also um, with the focus on partial dependence plot and permutation feature importance to see uh, can we maybe adapt these methods so that um, they don't break down or don't do anything stupid when the uh, features are dependent. To wind up, what are you most excited about in this field in the future? Uh, what's going to be emerging or what will the interpretability landscape look like in, I don't know, 12, 24, 36 months? I actually read a book that says that the people who are most deeply like involved in the field are the worst at making predictions, kind of, <laughs> or, or not so good at making predictions. So yeah, well, my, my focus is kind of, might not sound too exciting, um, but to look more into the limitations of their methods. And so this is coming up more and more that people are kind of taking those interpretability methods apart and see and, and looking like in which cases they fail or how you could misuse them. So things like this. So sometimes it doesn't sound as exciting as uh, let's uh, invent 20 new methods. But I think this is like where I would like to see the field evolve that because we have now so many methods. So when I started, actually, my PhD, I was like, ah, I will invent new methods. And now I'm like, okay, maybe, well, there's, there's a lot of stuff already. And I think we should make those work well and that we understand when they fail and how they fail. Where can people learn more about the book and follow you online? So mostly on Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, Christoph Molner. Yeah, my book is uh, online. So as a website as well. So... If, I think if you Google interpretable machine learning, you will find it. Um, yeah, then you can read it for free. Christoph, this has been really great. Thanks again for coming on to share your work and all your research. Thanks for having me, Tom. Thanks for listening to episode one of Data Skeptic Interpretability. Our guest today was Christoph Molner. Give him a follow on Twitter at Christoph M O L N A R. Our new theme song is Number Five by Big D and the Kids Table. Now, we didn't ask them for any permission or anything, so hopefully they'll be okay. Incidental music by Tanuki Suit Riot was featured in the introduction. Join us again next time when we'll start to unpack a lot of those techniques that Christoph introduced to us. We'll talk about some of the hands-on tools you can try. Oh, and you remember way back when? When a lot of you first heard about Lime here on Data Skeptic? That was a good episode. We're going to get back on that bandwagon. I've got a few other surprises for you. Between now and then, keep thinking skeptically of and with data.